At the end of March, ISIS un unleashed a horrible, horrific attack on Mozambique. Now, Mozambique is all the way at the bottom of Africa. It's right next to South Africa. So it's way down at the bottom of Africa. It's not up in the northern part where it's near the Middle East, where ISIS is, you know, is common. It is all the way down at the very bottom next to South Africa. And Mozambique uh, experienced this horrible ISIS attack that killed dozens of people. Um, here is the New York Times article here. It says ISIS claims responsibility for Mozambique attack. And it goes on to say that the Islamic State has claimed responsibility for a days long ambush of a port town in northern Mozambique last week that forced tens of thousands of people to flee the area and left dozens dead, including some foreigners. It says the attack on the town Palma was an alarming escalation of the war in the gas-rich province of Cabo Delgado, where insurgents with loose ties to the Islamic State have killed at least 2,000 people in a campaign of violence over the past three years. It says in recent months, the local insurgency has grown in strength and seized large swaths of territory, including the region's other main port town. Last week's attack demonstrated a new level of boldness from the insurgents and was the closest the group has come to a multi-billion dollar gas project that is operated by international energy companies. So um, one thing that they're kind of painting this this attack on so now ISIS, in order to fully understand this, you kind of have to understand a little bit of the history of ISIS getting themselves to Mozambique. So let me just go ahead and show you. Um, oh, let's see here. I want to show you where Mozambique is on the map so that you can kind of understand what we're really looking at. So here's here's Mozambique. OK, it's all the way down here, right next to Madagascar. And it is bordering South Africa. So it is quite a ways away from the rest of the Middle East, okay? And what the ISIS now, which has been, you know, mostly in the Middle East, it's kind of gone down into Somalia a bit and into some of these other areas of Sudan, right? We know that there's uh, that going on also, obviously in Libya and Egypt and Yemen, and you know we've got all of that going on there. But the history of ISIS kind of leaking its way down, all the way down to the, to the bottom of Africa, started really in 2017. In October of 2017, we really started seeing the rise of uh, terrorist attacks or jihadist attacks going on in Mozambique. And they've escalated and they've only gotten worse year after year after year. So October of 2017, we saw the beginning of it. And then in 2018, there were more attacks. And then in 2019, there were even more attacks. And it has escalated to record numbers to where now the attacks are at an all time high. I believe that they are maybe even close to 40 percent increased this year in Mozambique. So a um, couple of things here. So from The New York Times article. They lead you to believe that what ISIS is after are these multi-billion dollar oil and gas projects in Mozambique, that that's what they're looking to capture, that they're coming closer and closer to these oil and gas facilities. And that is, uh, you know, that's what they've got their aim, their their aim at. However, you also notice in the article that they talked about ISIS capturing port towns, right? So there was one port town that they had gotten and then they had captured a second one. So now they have control of two port towns in Mozambique. So why this is interesting is because a lot of people would then say, well, why is ISIS down there? How did they get there? Who's funding them? Right. They're, they don't just go down there for no reason. They don't go down there without resources in order to grow and to recruit. You have to have money. We know this because we've been really the culprits behind it, the United States, the West, uh, China's even done this on their own. Uh, this funding of, of extremist groups, funding of jihadist groups, and using them to battle our enemies, placing them strategically in areas or funding them and fueling them and training them in strategic locations in order to really sort of prevent the rise of a superpower, in order to keep a superpower busy. And we did this for many years against Russia. We started this in the 70s during uh, when Carter was the president and he was funding the uh, Mujahideen in Afghanistan. 
And we know in order to fight off the Soviets that were in Afghanistan, China did the same thing. They started funding their uh, they started bringing in more of the is of the extremist ideology into their Uyghur population. They were using their Uyghur population to battle the Soviets as well to keep the Soviets at bay. That has obviously backfired. Now they've got a lot of extremists in their Uyghur population, and that's what they're attempting to control now. It went out of hand. And that's what happens. You fund these people. You give them the ammunition. You give them the training. You give them the resources. You give them the ideology. You give them a cause. And ultimately, that's going to come back and get you. It's going to come back to bite you in the rear end. And we've seen that happen to us as Americans uh, funding these groups that then sprouted and became Al Qaeda, sprouted and become ISIS, sprouted and became the Taliban. We've seen it happen to us. China's seen it happen to them. It's not a good idea. The whole notion of the enemy of my enemy is my friend is not exactly true, right? So we're seeing this happen. We see it backfire. We've seen it happen in real time in Syria over the last uh, decade in Syria of the civil war. We've seen um, the the Obama's tactic of going and, and arming moderates, as he called them. There were no moderates, but arming the moderates. Well, what did that do? That turned... That became ISIS. What we ultimately did was train, fund, and arm ISIS. So we see that this is an age-old trick, right? And, and we did that because we were trying in Syria, as much as they were saying, oh, we're fighting terrorism. Really, what we were doing when we were funding what later became ISIS, we were trying to get rid of Assad. We were using it. We were using this extremist ideology. We were funding this extremist ideology in order to combat and uh, take down Assad. That was the whole goal. So this is an age old trick. We've been using this trick since the 70s, and it's never really turned out well. It's never worked. It's always backfired every single time. But nonetheless, it's the trick that our government knows. It's the trick that the deep state knows it's the trick that the powers that be know and it's a trick that seems to you know work to some degree so they keep doing it over and over again well now this is where you've got to pay attention and i've done another segment on this before but if you've missed it i'll give you a little bit of an overview you know that china has a belt and road initiative and china is the country to watch right so china is the one that's the big competitor they're the new soviets it's china they're the ones rising up they're going to potentially become a world power potentially their uh, currency will take over the u.s dollar as the world currency all eyes are on china everybody's worried about china so this is kind of china's uh initially this was their initial officially um mentioned belt and road uh, initiative that they were going to establish. This is the map of what they were trying to uh, trying to do. So they would kind of start this off. It would go through, you know, look at that, the Xinjiang region. I want you to pay attention to this because it's so important to understanding everything that's going on in the world right now. The new place to keep our eye on is going to be China, uh, all of the regions around China, uh, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, paying attention to the ports that they're wanting to take all of their goods and services into and looking more at that. But, you know, right now our government has kept us pretty focused on the Middle East and the Middle East is old news, guys. We're moving on to future news and future news is what's China doing. So here's China. They've got this Belt and Road Initiative. If they're able to implement their Belt and Road Initiative successfully, they will become the world power within the next 20, 30 years. They will overtake the United States as the strongest economy in the world. Most likely they've got some digital yun. Uh, I'm not saying that right. The, the, you, the, it's, I never say this right. And then you guys get on my case about the, it's not the yen, right? It's the, U, it's the yuan. It's kind of pronounced this way. Um, in fact, let me share with you a little bit of this story I've got in, uh, says that last year, the country, China, was testing out its newly created digital currency, the digital yuan. The, yeah, I'm not, anyway, I'm going to move on. I'm not saying it right. So it's a digital cash living in cyberspace. But unlike Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies, the digital yuan is controlled by China's central bank. In a trial, about 100,000 users have reportedly been able to make payments via digital yuan by using their phone or a special card. And while Beijing plans to expand the use of the digital money, it's raising concerns about increased government surveillance, especially since the money can be programmed to expire and traced to any user. And some U.S. analysts say 
The digital yuan spreading to other countries could pose a threat to the U.S. dollar, which has been reigning, which has been the reigning global finance since World War II. So uh, China is a big threat, right? And they've got their digital currency coming out that's controlled by China. They've got this Belt and Road Initiative, and they're trying to export their goods all around the world. They are going to be the rising new economy, and the United States doesn't really like that, of course, right? No one wants to be toppled and no longer be the the strongest, biggest economy in the world. So when you look at China now, at this map, uh, getting out of Xinjiang region is... Look at all of the Belt and Road really wanting to get out of that Xinjiang region. So now you can see why there is this push to stop China with what they're doing in the Xinjiang region and and their stopping of the Uyghurs. Now, the Uyghurs have a movement where they want to be separated from China. There's a separatist movement going on in the Uyghur region. Um, a lot of that is fueled from their uh, Islamist uh, extremism that is infiltrated into their Uyghur Muslim population. They used to not be extremists. That has built up over the years. Part of it's China's own fault. It's their own doing for funding it, fueling it, and using it to stop the Soviets. It's kind of their own fault. But nonetheless, it happened. And now they've got this problem going on in the Xinjiang region. Well, that that region is extremely important to the Belt and Road Initiative in getting the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, look at how many ports, how many, you know, um, roads are or uh, avenues come out of that area. So if you could get that area in civil unrest and if you could make it really a, uh, a, a civil war, you're not going to get anything in or out of there. You've now stopped China for maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years from their initiative. If you can create civil war in that region, look at what's going on in Syria, civil war for 10 years. So if you can create civil war, you've effectively stopped this initiative. You've stalled it. You maybe didn't stop it, but you've stalled it. It just depends on what China decides to do in order to uh, gain that region back, you know, and, and what kind of, uh, you know, how effective they are, unlike Assad, who's been not, he's had a difficult time getting his country back, right? But you'll notice something else. When you look at all of these, the, the roads here, you'll notice that they come, you know, the ones go through Xinjiang. Where do they got to go? They have to go through all of these, like, stand nations, right? All the stands. They got to get through the stands. And then they got to get through Eastern Europe. And they go into Western Europe. They also have to get through a bit of the Middle East area. You know, they've got to go through Iran, right? And they've got to go in through Turkey. And uh, they also need to, you know, look, you've got some other areas here. They've got to get around through here, this um, down in, in Asia, South Asia. They've got all of these, you know, Southeast Asia uh, places that they've got to go through into India. They're going to go through Sri Lanka. And then they go into Africa. And you see these areas in Africa that they're going into and around and they go up even through, uh, you know, this is one of the maps that they've got. But they've they've actually uh, named numerous cities and numerous countries that they're doing business with. One of them was Lebanon. Remember what happened in Beirut? Suddenly the port blew up. Oh, weird. <laughs> so odd. Uh, you are right. They've got like civil war going on in Xinjiang, right? So let's just kind of talk about all these areas that China's planning on going through. And what's going on in these areas? Suddenly, suddenly, really kind of as of 2017, suddenly stuff going on. You know, you've got China trying to get out of, oh, what happened in Sri Lanka? Remember that Easter, the Easter worshipers, uh, the Easter worshiper attack? They've got a rise in Islamists, extremists going on in Sri Lanka. You've got a rise, interestingly, going on of ISIS going on in the Philippines, in Malaysia. Like, what the hell is ISIS doing all the way over in Asia? What are they doing all the way in Southeast Asia? What are they doing in Malaysia? What are they doing in uh, Sri Lanka? What are they doing in the Philippines? Odd. Oh, but isn't this odd? This is where China wants to go for their Belt and Road Initiative. And then, of course, you know, you've got Iran. What's been going on in Iran? Suddenly things have been blowing up. I don't know. Kind of like that port in Beirut, maybe smaller, not as big. But oddly, there's a lot of different infrastructure buildings that suddenly have just uh, caught fire, blown up in Iran. Strange. Don't know exactly why that's going on. But interestingly, you know, these were all the things that China was saying they needed as they announced big deals with Iran for the Belt and Road Initiative. 
And it seems like everywhere they announce that they're going to use as a route out or a port, suddenly something odd happens. So what happened down in Mozambique? Now, this is way down here where there really isn't. You don't see an actual road going to Mozambique here. Mozambique is way down here. But China actually announced, starting in 2015, that they're wanting to expand their Belt and Road Initiative, that this is just a preliminary map. They've got bigger visions. They have visions to go all the way into South America. They have visions to go everywhere. They're going to make themselves a true world global trading power. And they did a deal with Mozambique in 2017. They started doing a deal with Mozambique. They announced, or maybe they did the deal in 2019 officially, but in 2015, they started meeting with Mozambique. Now, China's been meeting with all the African leaders and all the African in uh, many of the African countries. They do a summit every year. They spend about 100 times more money on African nations than we do. They really build up. You know, you've heard the stories, I'm sure, that they're building up Africa. They're doing everything they can for infrastructure, helping these nations become strong. Why is that? Well, because China is anticipating that they're going to be exporting a lot of their goods and services into Africa. Well, you need people with money in order to be able to purchase these goods and services from you. So you wanna build up economies because if you build up economies, people have money to spend. If they have money to spend, they spend it on you, you get richer, that's the way it works. So China has an invested interest in building up Africa and building up those countries and getting them up to par with the rest of the world, up to speed, bringing them into the first world and getting the people there wanting to buy products and wanting to really become that the new financial hub, that new center would be China rather than the United States. So China has been meeting with all of these African countries, African leaders, and also establishing port deals with all of these various countries. And interestingly, China, starting in 2015, started talking about started talking to Mozambique about their ports. So this is why the port part of the story is so important. The New York Times is focused on this multi-billion dollar oil and gas facility, right? Which I'm sure ISIS wants, but it's the ports that they're really after. And they've captured two of the ports. And so why are they not capturing the big oil and gas facility and instead they're capturing ports? Well, because that is what China wants. They want the ports. They need access to the ports and they need a stable uh, country that isn't under threat of terrorism, that isn't under threat of civil war. They need those countries stable, thriving, growing, healthy, and they need access to those ports. That's the point. So it leads us to question, what exactly is going on? in China? What is it, what is going on against China? Who is behind this? Uh, is there somebody behind this? We could ask that question. I don't know. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know. All I know is I'm connecting some dots here and the dots look pretty suspicious, right? I mean, it looks suspicious to me that suddenly ISIS has made its way all the way down to the bottom of Africa, that ISIS is in the Philippines, that ISIS is in Southeast Asia, that suddenly there's this rising up of the Uyghurs in the Xinjiang region and it's a lot of extremists are coming out of the Uyghur population. You know that the Uyghurs are one of the number one recruitment hubs for these uh, extremist groups in the Middle East. They go to the Xinjiang region, they get the Uyghurs, they recruit thousands of Uyghurs, and they go to war and they fight in Syria, and then they're defeated, and then they go back home, and that's what the America's banking on. Then these people, they, they go back home, these extremists go back home to the Uyghur region, to the Xinjiang region, and they wreak havoc for China. And then China tries to do something about it. And then the West says, oh, don't you dare do something about that, you racists. And that's the narrative. And the narrative is there in order to allow havoc to be wreaked so that China has to deal with it. And now we see port after port, location after location, place after place where China says they're doing a deal, they're doing trade. Suddenly we're seeing a rise in extremism or we're seeing a port blow up or a facility blow up or catch fire, something odd happens. So it's really something to pay big attention to, pay important attention to as time goes on. And I will continue to pay attention to this and continue to bring you um, more of these kind of stories that seem odd. I mean, ISIS in Mozambique, really? Why? All the way at the base of Africa? What the hell are they doing there? And we'll keep our eye on that because it's interesting. Now, what's also interesting about that is one thing that if there is some sinister power, uh, you know, that is behind the funding, fueling and exporting of extremism, which, you know, 
hey, if this is not a conspiracy theory, we know for a fact it's been admitted by our government that we've been doing this since the 70s, that we absolutely have been the culprits in doing this, that we have been using extremism in order to stop the rise of other superpowers. We're known for this. We've done it. It's documented. It's fact. So uh, we, you know, if, if we are the ones that are, which would be the most likely culprits, to be honest, that are behind this exporting of extremism, then it kind of leads us to wonder what will happen. What will China do in response? As China, you know, China's not dumb. They're seeing what's going on. They probably know this is what's happening. But China, unlike the United States, doesn't have 800 military bases all around the world. China has one. They have one military base in Djibouti. And which is right here on the map, if you're not familiar with Djibouti. It's right here. It's uh, right here in the Horn of Africa. And that is uh, the only foreign military base China has. So we'll see how China responds to this continued fueling of this type of aggression. Um, and extremism. This is not a new tactic. It's an uh, an old tactic. It's even a tactic China's used. So we will see what China does to combat this. And right now, what China's been doing in order to control the world, right, in order to bring them into their fold of being the new economic powerhouse, uh, they are using trade. They're using building up countries and and uh, bringing in their technology, bringing in their infrastructure, and then having control over that, right? Because they're the ones who help build it. So they're using that sort of business, um, business deals in order to gain leverage over other countries, whereas the United States uses military might. And this is also going to be this, you know, sort of shifting in mentality that is going on as we enter into the new world. Uh, there, where we see China using uh, more di diplomatic measures. Russia is also starting to do this. You know, Russia is kind of getting in on that game. They're learning. They're pivoting. They're realizing that it's not all about military force. It's about making friends. So, ch so Russia has been sort of taking a page, similarly out of China's book, where they go into the Middle East and they say, "Let's do some peace deals here. Let's let's broker peace. Let's uh, you know stabilize, uh, get peace talks going." And that's kind of been Russia's new mo. And that's been China's MO. And the United States is going to need to learn to pivot out of this whole military uh, uh, might constantly using bombs and aggression and exporting of extremism as the method for controlling the world. So we'll see. But we're going to keep our eye on that. And that is what's going on uh, with that attack in Mozambique. And I will let you know if there's more that happened. And if you know of some more of this information, I would love to hear from you. Please email me, Kim at KimIverson.com. Great to hear from you. Great to hear your thoughts on this. Or if you are a member of my Locals community, you can go ahead and post your information on my Locals page and uh, other people can comment. We can all kind of interact and kind of look at the information you've got together. That is another way to get the information over to me. But um, either way, I love to hear from you guys. I love to hear your thoughts on all of this. So please contact me, either email or through my Locals page.